From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the desk, Mr. Dollar. Your number's ringing now. Good. Hello? Hello. I want to talk to Dr. McLean. Who's calling, please? I'm not a patient. I just want to talk to him. This is Dr. McLean. I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. I want to see you. What about? About life and death, doctor. You must be drunk, whoever you are. Do I come to your office or do I meet you? You come to my office, I'll call the police. Get busy, then. I'm on my way. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Insurance Underwriters International Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McLean matter. Expense account item 10, $4, gasoline, for my rented car. I was in the filling station at the Statler Hotel having it filled up when George Riley stepped out from the lobby entrance. Hey, Dollar. Huh, Riley. I came down here to see you. What about? What do you think, what about? All right, get in. I got to thinking after you left me today about my girl, Terry. And you know what happened? No. The police came to see me. They told me practically the same thing you did. They said they were getting up a court order to exhume the body. Her body, they don't know for sure yet. They'll have a job making the identification. My girl, Dollar. Yeah, you mentioned that. We both know it'll be her, don't we? Sure we do. They have to go through with all this legal stuff, huh? This has to be right. That has to be right before they can do anything. That's right. Yeah. Hey, where are you driving? Around the block. Dollar, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to get my hands on the bird or put it down on the ground that way with somebody else's name. He was a doctor, wasn't he? That's what it looks like. Doctor who? You'll find out soon enough. Let me ask you something. How would you feel if you got the kind of news I got today, huh? You'd feel pretty lousy. Well, I feel pretty lousy. I was gonna marry Teresa Corbett a couple of years ago. I built her a nice house on a hill, and she disappeared. Just walked out. Yesterday, you come in and... You say she didn't walk out. She walked into a doctor's office one night and had a heart attack. You say this doctor gave her another name, his wife's name. He buried her and collected some insurance. And that's how she disappeared. Now, what about me? Huh? They came around to see me after she disappeared. They came around a lot asking questions. And now they think they found her. You and me know they found her, don't we? Yeah, I guess we do. I spent two years waiting to find her, and now she's dead. Why is she dead? I can't answer that yet. But this doctor, he can't answer it, can he? He took her and buried her under another name, just took her like she was some sort of clay doll, something used and something no one wanted anymore. He took her and buried her, and that was supposed to be that. Now, what's his name? Uh, Riley, you better go home for a while. Yeah, sure. I'll phone you later. Dollar. She wasn't any clay doll. She wasn't something you'd give a phony name to and put in the ground. She was what I loved and wanted and needed. Did she walk into his office and die with her heart trouble, or did it happen another way? I don't know. You got ideas? I don't know, I don't know. Dollar, you gonna find out? Yes. If you don't find out, I will. I stayed right there and watched George Riley lurch across the street and hail a cab. 
Then I turned back and found the freeway, rode it out to Sunset and all the way to the Pacific Palisades in the office of David E. McLean, M.D. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Sit down, sit down. He was a tall, broad-shouldered man in his early 30s. I shook hands with him and sat down. Well, that was a pretty startling telephone call, Mr. Dollar. I confess I was intrigued by it. You said you'd call the police. Well, I didn't. I don't know why I said that, really. But tell me, what is on your mind? I'm an insurance investigator, Doctor. Or didn't a woman named Pauline Henderson call you and tell you I was in town? Pauline Henderson? Pauline Henderson. I don't believe that A I... friend of your wife's, Doctor, an old friend who worked with her once. The kind of a woman who would recognize a picture if she saw it. I don't believe I remember. Then she didn't call you and tell you I was in town. Well, that's all right, too. She said she might do that, though. Don't you want to know why, Doctor? Well, I suppose so. Yes. Why? Because I went over to see this Pauline Henderson the night I got in. She was one on a list of names of people who might know your wife on sight. Oh? She got kind of upset about my going there and asking her questions. I don't blame her. I'm a stranger to her. She finally said she'd tell you about it. I said, go ahead and tell you. And so? You just don't have any questions about anything, do you? <laughs> I'm completely baffled by this whole thing. What's your point? Don't you really know why I'm here, Dr. McLean? I haven't the least idea, but I can not tell you we're wasting a lot of time. This is a nice office, Doctor. How long have you been here? A year or so. Why? Starting out, it costs quite a bit of money for equipment like this. Rental in a building like this, doesn't it? I don't think that's any concern of yours, Mr. Dollar. I do wish that you'd say what you have to say or do what you have to do and get it over with. Hmm? I don't know whether you're so anxious at that. Try me. I've been pretty patient with you. You come here and talk about a lot of vague things that I have no connection with at all. You make a strange phone call. You appear as though you're trying to intimidate me. You mention an old friend of my wife's... Pauline and... Henderson. Yes. What has she got to do with it? Nothing, really, except possibly as a witness... Oh? Witness to what? To an identification. She said she might call you. She was worried about an investigation I'm handling. What investigation is that? I understand you once treated a patient named Teresa Corbett. Teresa Corbett? Last treatment two years ago, February 1954. I had offices over in Hollywood in 1954. Are you quite sure that you have the right doctor? I am. Well, I don't remember a patient by that name. What did I treat her for? A heart condition. Oh? Well, we'll soon find out. Corbett, eh? Teresa Corbett. Uh, when was this now? February, 1954. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have anyone by that name in my files, Mr. Dollar, but it must be important if you came all the way to Hartford to ask about it. It's pretty important. Well, she might have come in for some little thing. and In that case, I wouldn't necessarily have a history on her. I understand she came to see you quite a few times. Could it have been another, Dr. McLean? It was you. Well, that's funny. Oh, now, wait a minute. Two years ago. My wife was my receptionist then. She wasn't too good at keeping records. Do you suppose I could talk to her and ask her? My wife is dead, Mr. Della. Oh. I'm sorry I can't be of more help. I thought every doctor kept a record of all his patients if they just came in with a nosebleed. Well... Now you see that you're wrong. Now that we've gone through all this, let's get down to business. What do you mean by that? I'll come right out and say it, Doctor. You should have kept a file on Teresa Corbett. You should have kept that one above all things. The fact that you don't have one is going to make me believe a lot of things I haven't really believed up until now. What things? What are you talking I'm about? I'm talking to you about your wife, who isn't dead at all. What? Four days ago, she came to me in Hartford, Connecticut... She said that Teresa Corbett died in your office one night and that you identified the body as your wife's. What and what's you... more, you collected $10,000 worth of life insurance on her. Here's a picture of the woman who gave me that statement. Is this your wife? Well? All right, I'll tell you. It is your wife, Doris McLean. And she's still very much alive. And the story she told me in Hartford is pretty much the truth. I've never seen a woman in that picture in my life. I ran into one person here in Los Angeles who recognized her right away. I've got a list of eight more people who'd probably recognize her. I can go to every one of them and get their statements to that effect, but I don't think I need to. I've got a pretty long statement from Doris McLean herself. It tells the whole story. Would you like to read it? No. Then maybe you'd like to make a statement yourself. I have nothing to say, Mr. Dollar. I didn't think you would, Doctor. <laughs> Doctor. 
On the strength of the evidence already assembled, I preferred charges against Dr. David McLean. He was taken into custody and arraigned for defrauding an insurance company. He refused to talk at the arraignment and afterwards when he was held in the city jail. Expense account item 11, $2.20, telegram. I wired Hartford advising Don Taylor of the events in Los Angeles. The following morning, I received an answer from him to the effect that he was bringing Doris McLean to Los Angeles. That should have made the case complete. That and the fact that the coroner's office had exhumed the body and it had been identified as Teresa Corbin. Well. Hello, McLean. What now? Oh, I thought we could talk. We can't, so that's that. We have your wife's statement how the whole thing worked. The coroner's man identified the body of Teresa Corbin. So? Your wife will be here tomorrow sometime. Her testimony will cinch it. Will it? You know it will. I want a statement from you. <laughs> Look, we aren't in a courtroom now, McLean, but we will be. It'll be a tough case from top to bottom, but we'll get you, and we'll get you good. A statement from you right now might save you some trouble, save you two years in your sentence. Oh, you're here to give me a break. No, I'm here because my job says I'm supposed to be here. I wouldn't want to save you anything, brother. The longer they send you up, the better I'm going to like it. But I'm not going to push too hard for a statement from you. I'm just giving you the chance to have your say-so right now and suggest that you go into court with a guilty plea. It's up to you. You know something? You'll never get me into a courtroom. Expense account item 12, 10 cents, one morning newspaper, which carried a complete story of the McLean case as well as the information that Dr. McLean had denied all charges and was freed on bail. That, along with his remark about not appearing in court, worried me. An hour later, I was out in the Palisades looking for a San Vincent home address. It happened to be a two-story building, but I didn't get up to his apartment soon enough. Hold it! Stop! Riley. You don't have to worry about your doctor friend anymore. You fool, you crazy fool. The court would have taken care of him. No. I wanted to do it personally. Oh, Riley. For my girl, Johnny. <laughs> For my girl. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a brand new, a rather startling statement from Mrs. McLean, without lies. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.